Hello, everybody, again, and welcome back. We are resuming our PWL International Seminar today after the summer break. I hope you had great holidays, and I'm very, very happy to see you all there again. As you know, this seminar is hosted by IFILNOVA in the context of the FCT-funded project Mapping Philosophy as a Way of Life, an Ancient Model Contemporary Approach, and it takes place uh, once a month in this virtual format. This is already our fifth session, and today we have the great, great pleasure to have with us Matteo Stettler, who is an old and dear collaborator of our research group in Lisbon and also of this project. I am going to very shortly introduce him. Matteo Johannes Stettler is still, right, a PhD candidate in philosophy at Deakin University in Australia. Australia. But as far as I know, he's re really, really soon going to change these uh, statues and earn his doctoral degree uh, with a thesis on Aristotle's Protracticus and its place in the history of um, philosophy as a way of life. He's currently an adjunct lecturer, lecturer in philosophy at the uh, Lorenzo de' Medici International Institute of Florence in Italy, and he collaborates with the research groups Philosophy as a Way of Life of the Pontif Pontifical Gregorian University of Rome and Forms of Life and Practices of Philosophy, particularly the research line on the art of living of the Nova Institute of Philosophy in Lisbon. He has published articles in several international journals, including Classical Receptions, Philosophy Today, and Foucault Studies. And his latest publication, entitled Thoreau's Stoicism in Letters to Various Persons, The Spiritual Direction of Harrison Blake, is forthcoming on the Journal of Speculative Philosophy. Today, he's going to give a talk with the title Dante and the Bolognese Averists on Philosophy as a Profession and a Way of Life in 13th and 14th century Italy. We are very much looking forward to it. So, Matteo, please, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Marta, for this presentation. Now I'll be sharing my screen. Hopefully, you'll be able to see it. Wait a second. Um, so, thank you, Marta, for your presentation. Thank you all for being here. Um, for my presentation. Uh, this is yet another experiment in a sense. This are, uh, is a work in progress. Hopefully what will eventually become in time uh, a postdoctoral uh, research project. But let's start right from the beginning of, of this story. So the aim of my presentation today is um, to ascertain whether and to what extent the Bolognese masters of the arts that were active in between the 13th and 14th century uh, in Bologna, the University of Bologna, managed to realize the ambitious model of the contemplative life, what Maria Corti, the Italian scholar, famously baptized, the model of an intellectual felicity, of a mental felicity. A model that these masters purported to incarnate and really represent. So I'll do so by studying the translatio, the transformation to which the Florentine poet and philosopher Dante Alighieri subjected such model in his own vernacular work, the Convivio. My main claim is that the primacy that, in contrast to virtually any other classic philosopher, Dante ascribes to ethics over metaphysics in that work, is to be read on the background, on the polemics, uh, on the background of the polemics that Dante Alighieri mounts throughout this work, throughout the Convivio, against the professional philosophers of his time. So by reclaiming the priority of the sphere of ethics and its directive function in human education, in fact, I'm convinced that Dante is not simply trying to overturn the master's contemplative life project, as some scholars have argued, but really I think he's trying to remedy to the corruption that in his eye has plagued philosophy since its professionalization. His aim is really to bring back philosophy to its original purpose. That is, I think that Dante wants to substitute the interest for money, fame, and dignity uh, that allegedly 
motivated some of these masters in their study of philosophy for what Aristotle before him had already identified as the chief good of all of humanity, chief good that Dante will extend uh, also to non-philosopher, to the likes, namely happiness, felicita. I'll conclude my presentation in the end by pointing to and briefly discussing one of the possible targets of Dante's polemics, namely the Florentine doctor and master of the arts in Bologna, Taddeo Alderotti. But we'll get there soon enough. Now, as we all know, uh, Hadeau's scholarships uh, did not only aim to establish that the ancients conceived philosophy as a way of life, but also to sketch somehow the historical conditions that brought this metaphilosophical conception to eventually disappear from the horizons of Western culture. So Ado's thesis on this point called into play medieval philosophy rather heavily, in maniera piuttosto pesante, says uh, a medievalist such as Gianfranco Fioravanti. It is, in fact, Hadot's claim that this historical process was inextricably linked um, with the rise to, linked to the rise of Christianity, and at least in the first stage, uh, with the, the assimilation of the exercises that were, were originally part of the philosophical life. Then, in a second fundamental step, one that coincides with the advent of medieval scholasticism. According to Ado, Christian theology became distinguished from pagan philosophy, now Christian theology becoming elevated to the rank of a supreme science, and philosophy being declassified to the rank of an ancilla theologia, a handmaid of theology. A handmaid of theology whose main role now simply consists in providing Christian theology the conceptual and thus purely theoretical material concepts to settle theological controversies arising from the Christian doctrine. So more precisely, as Fioravanti again notes, quote, this emptying of the notion of philosophy, according to Ado, would have fully realized in the late Middle Ages with the birth of the university and the rise of the figure of the professor of philosophy. End quote. Now, we know that only two years after the first publication of Hadot's Exercice Spirituel et Philosophie Antique in 1981, the Italian scholar Maria Corti published the pioneering book La Felicità Mentale, Nuove Prospettive per Cavalcanti e Dante. In this way, inaugurating an interpretative model that could be used to challenge Hadot's thesis on the medieval decline of the ancient conception of philosophy as a way of life. So as Dragos Kalma succinctly put it, the term intellectual or mental felicity, quote, is used to summarize the scholastic appropriation of Averroes' interpretation of Aristotle's account in the Nicomachean Ethics concerning philosophy as the supreme good <clears throat> and source of happiness. According to some key figures of the 13th and 14th century, such as Boethius of Dacia and Sigur of Brabant, philosophy was an autonomous discipline with its own set of rules, methods, and objects of knowledge, and the study of philosophy represented the highest form of living." End quote. Now, despite some initial resistance, Corti's indirect critique of Hadot's narrative eventually found a fertile ground among historians of medieval philosophy, including, but not limited to, the Italian Luca Bianchi. So following Corti, Bianchi's claim is that, quote, in the last quarter of the 13th century, the vast majority of the masters of the arts in Paris shared the same enthusiasm for philosophy conceived, importantly, at the same time as a profession and as an exciting experience of contemplative life. And I underline at the same time, Bianchi tells us, 
against the alternative of Hadel and the Mansky, which also seems to me, as it seemed to Fioravanti, completely inapplicable to someone like Sigur of Rabat and Boethius of Tatia, end quote. Nowhere was this idea best formulated than in Bianchi's seminar article from 1987 by the title La Felicità Intellettuale come Professione nella Parigi del Duecento, namely intellectual felicity as a profession in 13th century Paris. There, in that article, Bianchi takes a polemic stance against that widespread view whereby philosophy did not quite exist in the Middle Ages, except as an ancilla theologia, as a preparatory and subordinate discipline to theology. So while, of course, the structure of the scholastic curriculum did suggest such a subordination, according to Bianchi, it was rarely noted in the literature of the time that that very same organization of the medieval university did not go unchallenged. And in fact, it, it had elicited in the 13th century a strong reaction, uh, precisely by the so-called Averroist movement, which according to him was primarily a sort of defense of the autonomy of philosophy as a discipline. So in parallel to this process of rethinking of philosophy and the domain of its expertise, uh, as Bianchi continues, the Averroes, quote, promoted a redefinition and in a certain way, a real construction of the ideal type of the philosopher, drawing with patience and meticulousness from the rich classical heritage from both Greek and Roman, and taking up from the 10th book of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, as well as from the related Arabic commentaries, an emphatic idealization of the philosophical life as the maximum actualization of man's intellectual potential, and thus as his supreme realization, one that would bring him, together with the sublime joys of speculation, also perfect happiness. Now, according to Bianchi, the rehabilitation of the ancient ideal of the contemplative life by the hands of these Parisian masters was thus primarily to be understood as the expression of the demands for more independence and more recognition of an emerging corporation of professional philosophers. In fact, the testimony of medieval masters such as James of Douai, Conrad of Magenburg, on the poor professional and living conditions suffered by these professional philosophers, quote, make us understand how the passionate praise of the theoretical life and the claim to the superiority of the philosopher were re-emerging in the Averroist movement also as a defensive reaction, a defensive reaction in the form of an ideal projection, both to the authoritarian imposition of doctrinal constraints and to a sense of real inferiority that was suffered both at a social level and within the academic world itself, end quote. So we now understand that Fioravanti was entirely on point when he had remarked that in a certain sense, quote, the cipher of the mental felicity um, introduced by Maria Corti worked as a catalyst of interpretations and trends, the outcome of which could present itself as a response to Alhado's thesis. Right at the beginning of its structuring as a public and university discipline, philosophy, in fact, presents itself in the Middle Ages as a form of life, even as the highest form of life, thus consciously linking itself to the tradition of the classical world." End quote. Now, on his part, Fioravanti himself seems to agree with Bianchi when it comes to interpreting the paradigm of intellectual felicity as the expression of the demands for more academic independence and for more prestige and recognition of a corporation, of a, a newborn corporation of university professors. 
From this intuition, however, Fioravanti will draw a very different conclusion and an interesting one. So the fact that at the origin of the idealization of the philosophical life among the Latin Averroists, there stood the claims of a university corporation does not imply for Fioravanti as it does for the other Italian scholar, Bianchi, that the conception of philosophy, that a conception of philosophy as a way of life and a conception of philosophy as a profession could not be or eventually become at odds with each other as Ado had generally assumed them to be. In fact, according to Fioravanti, it is worth considering the possibility that very much like in promoting their corporative interest, these masters might have idealized the model of the philosophical life that they set themselves to represent to such an extent to render such a model not only virtually out of reach for anyone, but also not actually credible for anyone else. After all, as the Italian scholar puts it, quote, in literature, the question remains open as to whether and to what extent the concrete teaching activity of a, professor, of a philosophy professor, including career, legal and economic relationships with colleagues and the authorities, and also penal quarrels and disputes, could approach the model of the speculative life of the philosopher of which these masters presented themselves as the exponents and heralds. End quote. Thus, we see that the terms of the debate for a scholar like Fioravanti are shifted. It is not anymore a question of whether the works of these Parisian masters were presented as recuperating, as reviving the ancient ideal of the philosophical life, because they most certainly were presented in such a way. Suffice it here to note the full title of Boethius of Dacia's work. The summo bono sive de vita philosophy, which means on the supreme good or on the life of the philosopher. As I have made the case elsewhere, the late Hado himself eventually arrived at the same conclusion uh, via the works of the Polish scholar Julius Tomanski. Now, the real question for Fioravanti is now whether behind that philosophical ideal, the philosophical ideal of a mental philosophy, there lay a real practice and a genuine effort, or whether it was simply part of a sort of propagandistic scheme contrived by these professional philosophers to acquire more social recognition and academic independence. The issue for the Italian scholar is particularly pressing if one insists on assuming, as scholars such as Alain de Libera and Carlos still has, have assumed that the project of these Parisian philosophers was inextricably linked to the doctrine or what Fioravanti calls the fabrication, the fabula, of the copulatio, the conjunction with the separate intelligences. For as, as Fioravanti explains, quote, Plotinus's affirmations on the attainment of the one or Augustine's experience in Ostia may still arouse our interest, but a corporation of university professors who, as Pomponazzi will eventually ironize quotidie pramden cum Deo, die every day with God, can only have an estranging effect on us and arouse the suspicion of the existence of an ideological propaganda behind which it is difficult, if not impossible for us, to identify any real practice, end quote. So as Fioravanti himself notes elsewhere, this question would seem to be particularly germane in the case of the Bolognese masters of the 14th century, people like Matteo da Gubbio, Taddeo da Parma, and Giacomo da Piacenza, precisely because, unlike the Parisian of the 13th century, unlike Boethius of Dacia and Sigur of Brabant, these fourth generation uh, of errorists seem to have unanimously subscribed to the doctrine of the conjunction with the separated intelligences. 
So it is important to note at this stage that this issue will be eventually reopened by a like philosopher like Dante, whose philosophical treatise, De Convivio, has long be a, been assumed to have been profoundly influenced by the thought of these Averroists, the Bolognese in particular. After all, how can we reconcile a disinterested love for knowledge, the spirit of a superior lifestyle with the profession of teaching, a profession that is sociologically characterized and determined in a hierarchy of offices and benefits, if not yet salaries, we may ask following Fioravanti's comments in his own commentary on Dante's Convivi. So according to Fioravanti, there could be only one answer to this conundrum. Quote, this solution proved theoretically impossible, and in fact, entirely in favor of the second option of the dilemma, end quote. So as I shall now try and, and make the case, this seems to have been exactly the same conclusion um, that also a like philosopher like Dante reached in his Convivio. The very first work of philosophy written in the Italian language. Now, so the ties that, uh, and the origin of the ties that link the Florentine poet of the Stil novel, Dante Alighieri, to the philosophical movement that developed in the Faculty of the Arts of the University of Paris in the 13th and 14th centuries can be traced to scholarly contributions that are almost entirely Italian. In fact, it was originally Bruno Nardi's merit to have brought to the surface uh, the many parallels uh, between the theses sustained by Dante and those of the Latin of Errorists. It will, however, be only with Maria Corti's works of the 1980s that Dante's alleged Averroism came to be more specifically associated with those Averroists that were active in the Bolognese studium. As we have already noted, in 1981, Corti has already published La Felicità Mentale, New Perspectives uh, for Cavalcanti and Dante is the subtitle. A book in which the works written in vulgar by precisely Cavalcanti and Dante, by the two Florentine friends and poets, namely the poem Donna Me Prega and the treatise Convivio, are presented as heralds of the contemplative way of life that was celebrated in the works of the Bolognese masters, such as the Questio de Felicitate by Giacomo da Pistoi. <clears throat> Now, while many of the details of Corti's proposal did not pass the test of time, her essential intuition concerning the ties connecting Dante to the notion of intellectual felicity that the Bolognese magistri had imported from Paris enjoyed a considerable success in, in critical literature, opening new horizons of study. I think that in a sense, Really, no one has developed Corti's intuition further than the French scholar Alain de Libera, who, in his work, Pensée à moyen Age, went as far as claiming that the significance of the rediscovery of the ideal of philosophy as a way of life in the Middle Ages um, by authors such as Seeger of Brabant and Boethius of Dacia is only later overshadowed by the importance of what he calls the deprofessionalization of that ideal of life outside the walls of the medieval university. In Alain de Libera's eyes, it is in fact only in the works of light philosophers, such as Dante's Convivio, for instance, that the ideal of mental or intellectual philosophy that was only briefly and imperfectly sketched in the works of the masters of the arts that will reach its fullest and finest expression. Now, <clears throat> studying the specific features of this transformation, of this translatio sapiensi, this transformation of the notion of philosophy in the passage from professional to like philosophers, 
was precisely one of the declared objectives of Alain de Libera in his work on Céa Moinage. However, only Imbach, either by himself or in co-authoring with König uh, Pralong, more recently made it his task to systematically investigate whether the works of likes like Dante, um, quote, should be interpreted as the translation of existing scholastic knowledge, knowledge that originated within the university system into the language of people, or whether instead the explicit and programmatic relationship with the lakes has an influence on philosophy as such, on the very notion of philosophy, end quote. So while Alain de Libera seems to assume a fundamental continuity uh, between the philosophical ideal that was championed by Parisian magistri and the one that professionalized outside of the medieval university, as we shall now see, for both Imbach and König Pralong, um, it, I, their suggestion is really that like authors like Dante do not limit themselves to simply to simply translating and popularizing in vernacular language the philosophical discourse that was developed in the university. But by doing so, by translating um, professional philosophy, they radically transform the very notion of philosophy that such discourse presupposes in a direction that strongly privileges practical over theoretical concerns, ethics and politics over metaphysics. And now we'll see exactly how that transformation took place. So according to these two scholars, Imbach and König Pralong, the transformation that the philosophical ideal reclaimed by the Parisian masters underwent in Dante's own project of a philosophy for the layman can be seen at work in how the Somme of Weta, how Dante distinguishes and organizes the different parts of philosophy in his commentary to the first song, Voi che intendendo il terzo ciel movete, in the second treatise of the Convivio. Dante <clears throat> there opens the allegorical interpretation of the song by explaining how, after the death of his beloved Beatrice, he was eventually converted to philosophy by reading Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy. And he also explains how he eventually started his apprenticeship, his philosophical training, nelle scuole degli religiosi, in the schools of the religious order, and attending the disputations of those philosophanti, of, of those philosophizers that early scholars have identified precisely with the Bolognese Averroists. So the Celi, the skies that are alluded in the title of the song, as Dante explains soon enough in his commentary, are the different sciences, the different scienze, which Dante organizes as follows. Quote, to the first seven spheres correspond the seven sciences of the trivium and the quadrivium, namely grammar, dialectics, rhetoric, arithmetic, music, geometry, and astrology. To the eighth sphere, namely the starry heaven, corresponds natural science, which is called physics, and the first science, which is called metaphysics. To the ninth sphere, interestingly, corresponds moral science, and to uh, the still heaven corresponds divine science, which is theology. End quote. So it is following perhaps his former master Brunetto Latini, who himself apparently had challenged the primacy of theoretical philosophy, that according to Imbach and König Pralong, Dante here decides to elevate moral philosophy above uh, and over that kind of philosophy that Parisian masters in the medieval university following Aristotle had elevated to the rank of first philosophy over metaphysics, that, that is. Now, the cosmological analogy is instructive, according to both Imbach and König Pralong. The sphere that Dante associates with moral science, with the scienza morale, the ninth in his order, 
um, plays a fundamental role in, cos in medieval cosmology. In fact, this ninth sphere usually orders the movements of the entire cosmos, including the terrestrial and sublunar world. This means that, as Dante himself <clears throat> cares to point out, that <clears throat> if this sphere, this ninth sphere, ceases to move and perform its ordering function, everything would plunge into the deepest chaos. There, wouldn't, there would not be any more life, Dante tells us, nor or time, living the universe as a whole, disor disorder, disordinato, he says, and the movements of the other spheres, useless, basically, in that. So by analogy, the same would happen if moral philosophy was somehow to stop performing its ordering function. Quote, likewise, if moral philosophy ceased to exist, the other science would be hidden for some time and there would be no generation or happiness in life. And in vain would this bodies of knowledge have been discovered and written down long ago, end quote. So according to Imbach and König Paralong, the architectonic primacy uh, that Dante here ascribes to moral philosophy over metaphysics, really its elevation to the rank of first philosophy is completely new uh, compared to what was usually maintained in the medieval intellectual tradition. They call it a real turning point in the history of the way philosophy is conceived. Thus, as Imbach himself had already concluded in his 1996 book, Dante, La Philosophie et les Laïcs, it is, quote, in clear contrast with the Aristotelian tradition, according to which metaphysics is the queen of the sciences, that this concept of Dante grants moral philosophy the first place among all the sciences, thus realizing a radical, quote, transformation of the philosophical project, culminating in the primacy of practical reason, quote, end quote. A project that seems to be, quote, directly linked to the function that Dante attributes to philosophy. Intended for a lay public, it must first, first of all, help men lead a human life worthy of that name, end quote. So by considering <clears throat> the primacy that Dante ascribes to morality as an extraordinary proposition in the philosophical discourse of the Middle Ages, Imbach and König Kralong continue a line of interpretation that was early on inaugurated by Etienne Gilson. He was in fact a French savant that in his 1939 volume Dante la Philosophie had argued that Dante's thesis on the primacy of ethics over metaphysics is quote, quite extraordinary, end quote. Interestingly, Gilson himself had already pointed out, uh, well before Imbach et König Paralong, that the high rank reserved to morality in the convivio could be explained by appealing to a series of considerations regarding the specific aim and public that this work was supposed to reach. After all, as the French scholar tells us, referring to Dante, quote, Dante is a man who suffers and seeks in philosophy the means to console himself. Dante is an author who addresses himself to men of action, to teach them to mold through philosophy lives that are essentially practical and hardly in any way speculative, end quote. So needless to say that this thesis did not go unchallenged um, in literature. In fact, the first, a very first objection was raised by the Italian Bruno Nardi as early as in 1940. Nardi was concerned that Gilson, very much like Imbach and König Pralong after him, may have too readily inferred from the hierarchy of the sciences that Dante erects in the Convivio, the primacy of ethics over metaphysics. After having demonstrated that Dante, that the division of, of the parts of philosophy in the Convivio is not as extraordinary in the Middle Ages as Gilson wanted us to think, Nardi is also keen to point out that 
It is precisely in the convivio that we find a set of unequivocal statements to the effect that the status of philosophy as prima filosofia, as first philosophy, is not really to be disputed. So per lunga consuetudine, by long-standing custom, Dante writes in the third treatise, um, the sciences on which philosophy most fervently fixes her gaze are called by her name, as for example, natural science, ethics, and metaphysics. The last of which is called the first philosophy because philosophy fixes her gaze on it out of the greatest necessity and with the greatest fervor, end quote. Moreover, Nardi concluded, Gilson's interpretation is not really able to shed light on Dante's reasons for elevating the moral sciences, the moral science above metaphysics in the hierarchy of the sciences that he drafts in the second treatise. Morality, in fact, <clears throat> as the Sommo Poeta, as Dante tells us at a certain point, quote, disposes us properly to the other sciences. Thus, as Nardi correctly noted, quote, Dante does not contradict what was commonly thought about the primacy of metaphysics. And in placing morals above all other human sciences, he was induced by a perfectly Aristotelian motive, since ethics points out to men what the supreme good is and shows him the way to achieve that supreme good. Speculation of the truth is the highest and most noble human operation. But moving the intellect to learn speculative sciences is a task that is proper to ethics, end quote. So the apparent tension between the architectonic primacy that Dante seems to ascribe to ethics um, and the superiority of the contemplative life that he asserts in many places of the convivio attention which Gilson struggles to come to terms with, uh, is thus, concludes Tardi, nothing but a non-existent aporia. In fact, metaphysics for Dante maintain its primacy as the highest form of, of happiness that human beings can aspire to on earth. But it is up to the discipline of ethics to direct us, to dispose us towards that end. This conclusion was also recently shared by a scholar like, by the name of Pasquale Porro, who brings it even a step further. He says, quote, the identification of morality with the ninth heaven, the scholar tells us, does not concern the practical life as such, but practical philosophy. And therefore, in any case, a form of speculative philosophy, a speculative activity, end quote. In fact, Porro elaborates on his view on the topic more at length in his introduction to the Italian edition of Inbox, Dante, La Philosophie et le Laïcs. There the scholar writes in a long quotation that I think is worth reading, quote, the preference given to the ethical political sphere in Inbox work on Dante and the Laïcs does not imply the setting aside of other instances of natural philosophy, metaphysics, or theology, but rather implies, once again, particular attention to philosophy itself, understood as an intellectual practice. On the other hand, if it's true uh, that the scholastics following Aristotle and the Arabic thinkers seem, on the whole, in contrast to the layman, to argue for the primacy of speculation, it is also true that in Aristotelian terms, theorizing is still an activity, an energeia, which is never carried out in isolation and retains its precise social function. In one case, as in the other, he says, importantly, for our purposes, that is for university teachers, such as the masters in the medieval university, as well as from, for lay people like Dante himself, what matter is that philosophy is not lived as an end in itself, but as something that helps us to live and die better. Philosophy is practice to be happier and to respond more adequately to the human essence, end quote. So I think that Poro here is generally right when he makes the point uh, 
a point that was uh, made several times also by Pierre Hadot, uh, that for Aristotle, as well as for his medieval commentators, the theoretical life is not a pure abstraction, uh, but it remains, in fact, a life and a praxis. It is a theoretical practice, to be sure, but a praxis all the same. As we shall now see, however, that for all the, their differences, the projects of the masters, of the professional philosophers, and the lays of the laymen largely converge in their shared commitment to philosophy conceived as a way of life, as Poro argues, I think, is a claim that Dante himself, as a, as a lay, would have probably called into question. And let's see now uh, how. So everything that has been said so far, I don't think is to say that the primacy that Dante ascribes to ethics in the convivio is not a relevant development at all in the history of the conception of philosophy, and that perhaps the transformation um, to which he subjected the notion of philosophy does not amount to anything uh, more than the mere linguistic and conceptual vulgarization of the philosophical discourse that was developed within the medieval university. I think that Gilson really was right when he was pointing out that Dante's hierarchy of the sciences in the second treaties constituted something like, quote, the indicator of a real shift in cultural axis, end quote. By making ethics and not metaphysics the queen of all the sciences, and thus by emphasizing the directive power of ethics, over metaphysics, as Fioravanti has already pointed out, I think that Dante really wants to reorient the knowledge of the schools, considering it as the instrument not of careers uh, and personal affirmations, but of a project of ethical and political reform of society. In other words, as Fioravanti says, it is a question of assimilating, quote, the high science of the schools subordinating it, however, to a project of ethical and political reform aimed precisely at a lay audience, end quote. I think that it is precisely on the background of this sort of culture-making shift that we should read the harsh polemics that Dante mounts in many places of his convivio against the professional philosophers that operated in the academic world of the time. So it is justifying his preference for the Italian vulgar over Latin in the Convivio that Dante first points, uh, points his finger at those literati, at those learned people that because of their greed, uh, he considered not worthy of that very title. He says, quote, to their shame, I say that they should not be called learned because they do not acquire learning for its own use, but only insofar as through it, they may gain money or honor. Just as we should not call a lute player, someone who keeps a lute in his house um, for the purpose of renting it out, as opposed to playing it, playing on it, end quote. It is however only in the third treatise of the Convivio that Dante specifies who precisely those learned people that constitute the target of his critique are, namely the jurists of the faculty of jurisprudence and the doctors of the faculty of arts and medicine in Bologna, whose disputations Dante had already told us that he attended during the early years of his philosophical training. And also, finally, almost all the religious people, he says, um, the religious people whose schools Dante had attended in, in the very same period, in the, in the period of his philosophical training. Let's quote. Nor we should not give the name of true philosopher to anyone who is a friend of wisdom for the sake of utility, he says, as are jurists, physicians, and almost all those belonging to religious orders who study not in order to gain knowledge but to secure financial rewards or high offices. And if anyone were to give them what they seek to gain, 
they would not persevere in their study, end quote. So the magistri <clears throat> here under attack by Dante are those who pay to get access to a certain domain of a philosophical knowledge at the university, only to then resell that knowledge on the market. Those who gather philosophical knowledge, not for the end of perfecting their lives or those of others, but to impart it in exchange of a compensation and thus pursue philosophy, not for its practical use, but merely for its exchange value. So as Fioravanti uh, once again correctly puts it, we quote, we find ourselves here right in front of a trison de clef, where the professionalization and monetization of knowledge distorts its purpose. A true trison de clef in which an entire class of intellectuals has failed in their task, that of using knowledge to promote a good life worthy of men and not beasts. So in conclusion, I think if we stick to Dante's own testimony, it would thus seem that there existed only one major difference between the models of intellectual felicity that were promoted by the masters, by the professional philosophers of the time, and the one that Dante himself advocated for in the Convite. So Dante generally celebrated philosophy, and more specifically, first philosophy, metaphysics, because he, very much like Aristotle, was genuinely convinced that there, there resided um, the highest good of all of human beings, including you know, people that did not quite have a philosophical education, that is, including the likes. And that, you know, high, then the highest good is, of course, happiness. This itself is a realization that only the sphere of ethics can give us, according to Dante. Instead, the masters, the professional philosophers, whose project Dante would have probably considered unsupported by the directive power of ethics, allegedly pursued philosophy only with a rather uninspiring goal in mind of securing more fame and riches for themselves, and more social recognition and economic power for the cast of professionals to which they belong. So I think that by emphasizing the architectonic primacy of ethics, Dante really wants to substitute the interest for money and dignity that allegedly motivated the masters for the chief good of all of humanity, happiness, of course. All of this in an effort which in a sense anticipates uh, those eventually made by Renaissance humanists like Petrarch to bring philosophy itself, by now merely a profession among others, back to its original role as the guide to the happy life. Now let's move rapidly um, to the last part of my presentation. So while um, clearly identifying the target of his critique with the professional philosophers of the time, Dante in the Convivio is generally reluctant to give out names, with only one possible exception. In the first treaties of the Convivio, Dante sets up his project of a philosophy for the layman as surpassing two previous fallacious attempts to popularize Aristotle's um, moral philosophy in a non-Latin language. To vulgarization of a popular rico arab compendium of the Nicomachean ethics, the so-called Summa Alexandrinod, uh, a vulgarization, one undertaken by the Florentine doctor and master of the arts in Bologna, Taddeo Alterotti, and the other one, uh, a vulgarization in French, by none other than uh, Dante's own, own master, Brunetto Latini, own teacher, Brunetto Latini, in the, the so-called Etiquette d'Aristote that occupies chapters 1 to 49 of his uh, Tresor, of the second book of the Tresor. So interestingly, in the Convivio, Dante presents Taddeo Alderotti's abilities as a translator as subpar. He says that Taddeo's Vulgar, vulgar language is laido, which means in Italian literally dirty in Florentine. However, more importantly for our purposes, 
Dante also questions the moral end of Tadeus of the Rotti's project of vulgarization, especially as these came to be realized in a booklet by the title Libello per conservare la sanità del corpo, a booklet to preserve the health of the body. So quite problematic for Dante, this little collection of ancient medical precepts seem to have one too many addresses, as we read in the beginning of the work. As Tadeo de Rotti tells us, quote, moved by the prayers of a friend of mine, and also by the common utility for every man who lives like beasts, and for the conservation of health and life, I set myself to create this booklet out of the sayings and the books of the ancient philosophers, end quote. So Tadeo declaratively wrote the libello for the benefit of all those human beings, he tells us in a, in a way that clearly anticipates uh, Dante's own efforts in the convivio, all those human beings that go around conducting themselves like beasts. So while Tadeo and Dante does share, in a sense, the same audience, in Tadeo's booklet, this universal dedication to all human beings uh, coexist with that to a particular individual, interestingly enough. That very dear friend that he mentions at the beginning, that according to a scholar, Sonia uh, Gentili, we should identify with the knight Corso Donati, who was a figure that was so powerful and influential in the late 13th century Florence to render this dedication an immoral and purely self-serving act in Dante's eyes. It isn't precisely to this dedication, in fact, um, this dedication of Tadeo's Alderotti's booklet that Dante will critically refer uh, to in the Convivio when he makes the example of gifts that are of no use to the receiver. So for Dante, really, Tadeo Alderotti incarnates all that is wrong with uh, the professional philosophers of the time, and generally speaking with the university system. In his hands, philosophy and the medical science uh, become nothing but means to the all too worldly ends of fame, social prestige, and riches. And in fact, it is no wonder that in Paradise uh, 12, Canto 83 to 85, the Sommo Poeta, Dante Alighieri, will contrast Taddeo Alderotti's figure um, with that of San Domenico, who is taken to represent the disinterested pursuit of science for the love of divine wisdom. He says there, and allow me to read first the Italian version, Non per lo mondo per cui mo s'affan di retro ad ostiense ed a Taddeo ma per amor della verace man in picciol tempo gran dottor si feo. Which means, not for the world's sake, for which men now toil, following the men of Ostia and Taddeo, Taddeo Alderotti, but for the love of spirit food, the man, so great a teacher did he shortly make himself. So actually, the same image of the Florentine doctor, Taddeo Alderotti, can be independently reconstructed on the basis of the references that were put together in a study uh, from 1926 by Zaccagnini with the title La Vita dei Maestri degli Scolari nel Studio di Bologna nei secoli XIII e XIV. That means the life of the masters and students in the Bolognese study, in the Bolognese University in the 13th and 14th century. Zaccagnini, in fact, notes that, quote, among the lecturers in medicine and the arts at the University of Bologna, we meet men who manage most certainly with the always lucrative exercise of their profession to accumulate enormous wealth. And among these, there was precisely Tadeo Alderotti, who, thanks to his connections with prince, um, princes and high-ranked members of the clergy, it is said to have amassed uh, to have put together incredible riches. Now, it does seem that 
in a sense, the model of an intellectual felicity as a profession, um, what Fioravanti suspects might have been simply a propagandistic scheme contrived by these professional philosophers to acquire more social and economic recognition, eventually paid out. If not in Paris, where that model was strongly condemned and suppressed by Bishop the Bishop Tempier, at least in Bologna. So I would like to conclude this presentation by noting um, that Zaccanini's account seems to lend credence to at least two suspicions, two suspicions that of course would need to be investigated further. First, that the suspicion of Dante himself concerning the disinterestedness with which masters of the arts and medicine in Bologna, like Tadeo de Rotti, pursued philosophy and the medical science. The second suspicion is that of contemporary medievalists like Gianfranco Bioramanti, who called into doubt the very like the authenticity of the motives of the interest that brought the Bolognese professors of philosophy to celebrate the Aristotelian model of the contemplative life. So I think that would be actually all for what I've prepared today. Many thanks for your patience. I hope I was more or less on time. Many, many thanks, Matteo, for this very rich and thought-provoking uh, presentation. And thank you also for respecting the time. It was almost oh, perfect. Did, did right? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> We have now time for some questions. If you want to intervene, please raise your hand. I see Elder Tello, then Professor Privitello. Elder? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Matteo, for this presentation. Uh, very detailed, very clear. Uh, it was very fascinating to see uh, not only this attempt at reconstruction of what happened in the 13th century, but also the scholarship around it, especially in Italy, but also in France. Um, I'm actually curious about two things. Uh, so um, the first one is exactly how important philosophy was for these thinkers, considering uh, the role given to theology. For instance, concerning the sky, theology seems to yep. be at the center. So it seems to be even more important than ethics and metaphysics. Yep. So I wonder if there isn't some sort of prejudice in scholars when referring to this period, talking about these thinkers as being merely philosophers, mm -hmm. where when theology was perhaps more important for them. So I was wondering yep. if theology is just some thing that they admit in their systems just to uh, uh, be less polemic in their context, and they are at heart simply philosophers, Aristotelians, or if there is a significant change that wasn't reflected in your presentation. And together with this, I was wondering if their own uh, theology, assuming that uh, they also have this uh, theological dimension, would not be interpreted as a heresy and a sort of Pelagianism. Uh, so the idea that there's no original sin, that we do not need grace, we can reach salvation via reason and human will. So uh, this apparent adoption of Aristotelian philosophy seems to suggest something that go, moves along these lines. So I was wondering if there was also some sort of polemic regarding this yeah. in their own time. I can actually answer both points because they're really, they're really connected. I think these are wonderful questions. Um, they allow me to bring into play things I couldn't speak of in, in my presentation. So one of the reasons why I'm really fascinated, especially with the Averroists that were active not in Paris but actually in Bologna so a sort of third I think they're called third and fourth generations of errorists the first one is that actually in Bologna we you know the university in Bologna did not have a faculty of theology until late in the 14th century like after the half the first the half of the first century which means that philosophers there unlike in Paris they enjoyed an um, incredible degree of freedom, in a sense. They were not subordinated, philosophy was not subordinated 
to you know the the will of theology in a sense it was not conceived as sort of preparatory merely preparatory discipline to um to theology which is interesting um and and in fact because of this reason precisely because you know because of the absence of a uh, faculty of theology you know the Bolognese of Aries never went through what the Parisian went through. So the Parisian went through actual series of condemnations by the Bishop of Paris and condemnations that, I mean, it is still contentious just how effective they were in suppressing the spirit of the philosophers in, in a sense, the critical spirit of the philosophers. But certainly, you know, you know, a, a various, it, I mean, it, it restarted also after the condemnation, but it was certainly a big hit in a sense. So it's so, and your your question once again it points to a very critical juncture in the literature. It is of course very much contentious, just how much Christian these philosophers were. In a sense, of course, they also you know they um, the the idea that there was at a certain point in literature that these scholars like scholars such as Boethius of Dacia and Sigur of Brabant were um, advocating for a theory of double truth, which is to say there is a sort of religious truth based on revelation, but there is also philosophical truth based on, on, on reason. That's somehow, at least in literature, has been debunked as a sort of myth. But, but again, it, 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 it's still a problem in, in many regards. I mean, the, it, it's, the point is that all these scholars never claim that the highest possible um, happiness is only the one that we can reach by reason. They would say actually the true, they make a difference between felicitas, like happiness, and beatitude, like beatitudo. So in beatitudo is something you reach, you know, in the afterlife when, you know, you, you get to contemplate God. But here on earth, uh, we do have the possibility of being happy. And that happiness is conditioned, you know, we reach that at the condition that we, exercise the highest part of ourselves, which is the rational faculty. So in a sense, they, they just, uh, uh, how, how would you say that? They just keep on the side the question of beatitude and they you know, focus all their attention on, on, uh, on felicitas proper, it's like intellectual philosophy that we can reach here. But of course, you know, they had to say they were Christians because at the time, you know, it, it was hard. But yeah, so I hope hopefully I've answered to your question. And also Dante, just to go back to Dante, also Dante had, he never uh, claimed that, you know, for instance, like in the very hierarchy of the sciences, you see after, after morality, after moral sciences, on the highest step, we find theology, of course. But also according to Dante, theology provides us with a beatitude that is accessible only in the afterlife, only you know, after we're dead. So... When it comes to providing a philosophy for uh, the greatest number of people, which was Dante's aim, uh, he had to resort to philosophy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was very elucidating and interesting. Thank you. Just, just a quick, quick comment on what you just said. Sure. If, if theology is ranked higher than than philosopher, and then philosophy doesn't that imply a certain devaluation of philosophy? And, and of course, the idea that philosophy isn't actually ultimately able to provide you with a with the right way of life or with a recipe for happiness. Even if you distinguish the two, even if you distinguish the two kinds of happiness, I imagine that if you rank theology higher, then your right. your uh, uh, mundane happiness also needs to be somehow necessarily connected to the idea of God, isn't it? So. Well, according to them, it actually that's 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 the point. It's just that theology somehow deals pertains. I mean, and, and busy itself only with whatever happens in in the afterworld. But it, 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 many, you know, many of these scholars thought that, you know, actually the actual happiness that you get to experience on Earth by way of philosophy by philosophizing is a sort of preparation to experience the highest beatitude that you'll get to experience once. So there is, in, in a sense, a certain idea that philosophy is still a preparation. Um, but interestingly enough, all these philosophers never 
you know, never linger on, on questions of the attitude. Not, I mean, they, they write whole treatises on, you know, earthly happiness. That's their main focus. So, you know, it's hard to say, as, as we we're saying with Helder, how much of a devaluation we find there of, of, uh, of philosophy, in a sense. I mean, for them, they were really extreme in their, in a sense, their celebration of just how awesome philosophy is and just how powerful um, an enterprise it can be, how beneficial for us. Um, they really created, I mean, we find in those texts really sort of exaltations of the figure of philosopher and really, in a sense, uh, you know, over idealization of what a philosopher can be. One, one in fact, of uh, critical points of a scholar like Fioravanti is that these scholars might have just overdid it in, 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 in the way in which they celebrated the figure and the possibilities of philosophy, uh, which is something that can reasonably create some suspicion concerning their whole enterprise. Yeah. Uh, Professor Privitello, yes. Sì, sì, yeah. thank you. Um, Matteo, guarda, questa casa è una, stata una cosa così tremenda per me. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Sono anche italiano, va bene, siciliano. Ah, va bene. è tutto diverso. But no, uh, sincerely, going to Dante is just, it's just amazing. And I'm so glad, of course, you brought up the Paradiso, you know, Canto, what is it, 12. Yeah, but, right. um, but when you were reading that, I was, you know, again, I was looking through it again. And of course, it mentions Taddeo, right? of course, never the last name. So mm -hmm. there's like three Taddeos in Bologna at the time. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm like, will the, please, will the real Taddeo please stand up? Which <laughs> one is it? And you did mention Taddeo uh, da Parma. Taddeo da Parma, who was another Everest. Who's yeah. another one. And, Tadde yeah. and there was another one, Taddeo Pepoli, I read yeah, about, true. that was a jurist and all that. Yeah, but I true. think. If, I, I wonder if you played with this or if you thought about this moment in, in Paradiso when Dante mm -hmm. says that and you read the first two lines, I think right. the three lines, ma per amor della verace manna, like he, they don't go after the true manna that's spiritual, right? right? So he's referring to, he says, these folks who are making money, who are becoming, uh, you know, literati, they're literati, are not like San Domenico, who must be San Domenico was the true doctor. All right. But then he says this thing, which is amazing. He says he goes through um, tal che si, me, che si mise in cercuio la vigna per tosto in bianca el vignaio e reo. It's just amazing when I was reading this and trying to figure it out. Is it true that you know this, that, okay, San Domenico was, uh, well, they say that actually Christ would be the ortolano uh -huh. you know, the true divine, you know, vineyard, you know, tender. Mm -hmm. But, um, but uh, Taddeo, um, uh, Taddeo actually, Alderotto, I don't know why it's Alderotti, not Alderotto, I thought it was Alderotto. But... Hey, that's right. It's a, uh, I, I find different, different yeah, names yeah. in literature for some reason. Yeah. Right, right. But he also, didn't he discover Aquavita, you know, the, the actual distillation of, he, he made grappa. I mean, he's my guy. He's he's making <laughs> grappa. <laughs> but what do you think of that? I mean, this is more of a you know. I mean, no, no, absolutely. You're absolutely mean. right. And I must I must confess that in my account of in my reading of that couple of cantos in the part of these, I'm following the great scholar um, of the field by the name of Sonia Gentili. She wrote this um, amazing book titled. Um, oh, I have it here. The Aristotelian Men at the Origin of Italian Literature, which is an, uh, like uh, an, a, a great read for uh, for this this field. But it's actually true. I mean, uh, you know, we, we are not sure a hundred percent that that Matteo corresponds to the uh, to the actual right. Alderotti. Right. I mean, it's it's a sort of speculations. But I mean, it's 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 interesting that. Of course, Taddeo Alberotti comes up, uh, comes up, of course, in the Convivio. Uh, so we have that reference. And, and also, the other, it's interesting, the other character that gets um, compared to Taddeo Alberotti, I mean, which is, makes the whole comparison more credible, uh, is a guy, uh, Ostiense, 
that is actually Enrico da Souza, who was a jurist, right. which is why Dante, ten, Dante tends to couple all these professional thinkers, in a sense, all together, jurists, doctors. So also the reference to Enrico da Souza, the Ostiense, you know, gives credence to the idea that it might be actually Tadel de Rotti. But of course, we and I think I, I, I think you're correct because this little it's almost like not a joke, you know. But this La Vigna, you know, mentioning grapes, yeah, and right. all, is really such a fine thing there. It's just a it's a wonderful find. But he, I thought also I made a note that Dante I think mentions um, Taddeo Andreotto um, in um, the eleventh canto of Paradiso. It's sort of about his aphorisms. This the because he follows um, Hippocrates, you know, the aphorism. Right? Like, yeah. He did write, you know, another book about yeah. advices or something. But I find it, oh, this was, it was fabulous. A lot of, a lot of wow. fun. I'm, I'm glad you, you like yeah, it. I mean, tanto la sua pronuncia. Come pronuncia. I, I, try, I try my best, of course. <laughs> I just, you know, I'm from Florence, so it's, it's That's something. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Another question by Eli Kramer. Same, uh, a really wonderful presentation. And I'm going to try to uh, weave it through a thread. It just made me think of, is I wonder if you've thought about or have any reflections on now how you see it as part of this kind of dialogue, at least within the Western tradition, about the disinterestedness of philosophy, particularly mm -hmm. as a way of life, mm -hmm. both with a perfect and, you know, profession, but at least earlier with taking money. So, mm -hmm. you know, we we obviously see this with Plato and the Sophists. It comes right, up right, again right. in Philodemus, Philodemus as the first person arguably advocating that we can take money. So the way I'm going to frame the question is, do you see do you see a kind of simply a repeat in this tension? Or do you think yeah, that Dante and the discussion you're talking about sort of, is there has there been a development in the discussion? Or are we really stuck in the same conversation about whether yeah. this can really be done as as something with... Uh, let, let's even focus it more particularly with pecuniary interests involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's actually a very interesting. I haven't thought about it, but of course, of course, the 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 theme is the old age theme of you know the sophists against the philosophers, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, Dante was fully aware, probably, of all those discussions. He was incredibly well read in all the classics, such that one can just assume that. That also might be a sort of uh, reproposition of the same trope. Uh, I mean, the only let's say now from from the top of my head, the only relevant development, I mean, the only main difference that we can find with uh, the controversy between philosophers and and sophists is that here the sophists are really you know all the people that are in the university, not just people that devote themselves to rhetoric. But all professional philosophizers, really, he called them philosophizers because they are people, you know, they're jurists, they are uh, doctors, and also all the people that, that taught at the um, religious orders, at the schools of the religious orders. He includes almost all of them, he says, um, which seems to me, yeah, the, the only relevant development here. But yeah, that's... Uh, it just makes me wonder sometimes yeah. if we're kind of caught in a loop, you know, even PWL and or people like Bordeaux or critical university studies that it might be now the professions, which is, you know, yeah. closer to what the Avera was is developing out of Dante's uh, thought. But where mm -hmm. is, you know, Bordeaux's criticism of homo academicus, all the PR kind of complaints about yeah. universities <laughs> becoming merely pecuniary in the mm -hmm. way that they're thinking of or, you know, jobs focused. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't have an answer, but it's an interesting question yeah. for a PWL about if we're I agree. if we're stuck in the criticism, does that reveal something about the question and yeah. the kind of contention of building spaces for philosophy as a way of life that we have to think about? Yeah, right. And what about yeah the institution in which philosophy as a way of life can be practiced? Perhaps that's an, also an institutional question in a sense. Uh, perhaps once philosophy gets you know, uh, put in the context, and in any institutional context, it starts to assume those traits that Dante despised, perhaps. Uh, I mean, that could be 
a possibility in a sense gets corrupted perhaps just by being institutionalized uh, in a way you me, me and your lucio professor privatello and land of course have been thinking a lot about this so this adds some nice food for thought of this kind of continual theme which i'm i'm extremely interested in so thank you i mean yeah. absolutely like like dante was absolutely convinced that philosophy i mean it was a sort of crime to to not use philosophy, first of all, not to use philosophy as, you know, not only a mean means to acquire riches and fame and, and prestige, but to use that as sort of guide to happiness. And the second crime, the biggest of all, was that to keep philosophy just for a restricted elite of people and not really uh, just offer that sort of gift to even people that did not have uh, philosophical training or information at all uh, so he would certainly say that you know the institution like universities are a problem I mean, they are a problem just because they keep their knowledge for themselves and and that knowledge is uh, just useful and bene beneficial for anyone and look how that thread runs through thoreau as you and right. you know Hado has pointed in all the yeah. way to dewey you know who yeah. talks about the problems of men and the way academic internal navel gazing is going to kind of miss those two cardinal sins. So yeah, yeah anyways, it's so clear the theme runs through together. And so yeah. and, and also, you know, you're we are talking about an author, Dante here, that himself um felt on his skin like just how powerful and consolatory philosophy can be in the midst of you know a misery. Because he turned like to philosophy after having mm -hmm. lost his beloved Beatrice, so he was inconsolable at the time. He read one of the classics of philosophy as a way of life, I would say, Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy. And so for him, just that idea was just so, so important that he thought it was just a crime just to keep it in between the walls of the university or of an institution. Yeah. Can, I, can I add a, a moment with that? Um, Please do. And it's, it's, it's a great connection with Dante. And I've been working on another project on, on a, a, a paper and conference on shelling. Uh -huh. and on the belt altar and, and you know ages of the world and and Schelling is so deeply connected to Dante mm -hmm. and 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 his way he's like Schelling is thinking of a philosophical religion you know he's trying to combine the two as he mm -hmm. goes along his late late works but in the loss of his own wife he fell apart mm -hmm. and, and, uh -huh. and I think in bringing back Dante which he was working on before that and he even mentions part of these or like uh cantos the second canto um about uh, clara and all that how he entitled one of his pieces it's amazing how this connection was there to bring him back to life in some way to to be practical again yep. to instead yep. of um you know threatening to kill himself and mm -hmm. not just disappearing through you know the, the, through dante actually rereading that and and it's it's pretty amazing I mean, I, I really, I really see Dante as like sort of the last, sort of last uh, ring in the chain, in a chain of different conversions that really traverses the entire history of the notion of philosophy as a way of life. So, I mean, this has something to do with the work that I've done, also in my doctoral thesis. But of course, it starts in a sense everything with Aristotle's Protrapticus and and that exhortative writing that aims to. To encourage people to devote themselves to philosophy of course that was a text that was fundamental for some like cicero at a certain point cicero himself was inconsolable after the death of his own daughter and the end of his political career so he, cicero himself is somewhat you know inspired by aristotle's ex exhortative writing he wrote the hortensius the hortensius once again it, it's just another uh, exhortative writing another protracted writing Chances were that Augustine read the Hortensius, and it was precisely his reading of the Hortensius, of Cicero Hortensius, that ignited his conversion to philosophy. And then, of course, again, we have a text like Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy that was heavily reliant upon the protractic writings of the ancient world. And once again, Dante happened to read that text and just become convinced that happiness resided in in the study and the training of that philosophy can offer. Uh, so I think really it's, it's we should really include in a sense the figure of Dante. I mean, there has been a lot of talking in the last decade in in Dante's studies 
uh, on whether we should include, I mean, whether we should consider Dante a philosopher in itself. Um, and I think not only we should do that, we should consider him as a philosopher in the tradition of philosophy that we apply, in a sense. That would be my my take on, on, on the issue. But yeah, thank you. Okay, I, um, I think Leonard also wanted to make a comment. Can you unmute? Wait, I will. Uh, can you switch on your microphone, Len? I, I, does this right. work? Yes. Okay. Yeah, good. I just wanted to say that I think that the uh, distinction that we're floating here between institutionalized and non-institutionalized philosophy is not right. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 institutions build up around all human activities. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, when you when you leave one, you sort of like create or become the birthplace for another, and and so our discussion really isn't about philosophy, institutional, non non institutional, but more about the ways in which we want to the kind of normative structures we want to build. Yeah, and this this could be within the university or outside the university. Yeah, I totally. I mean, agree. The, yeah, the the uh, modern. Uh, you know, multiversity of uh, Clark Kerr is all about money and power. Mm -hmm. And if you see the way that the philosopher gets constructed within that setting, mm -hmm. well, you know, to stay afloat, he has to get grants from the National Science Foundation yeah. or uh, whatever. And so then it becomes uh, a, a kind of one institutionalization in which the philosopher is constructed, but it's not the only one. No, no, well, I totally agree on that point. I mean, institutions are really not only necessary, but, you know, we can not do without them, right? Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, they're necessary. Probably it's more a matter of the kind of incentives that are active within uh, an institutional setting. And, and norms of power structure, right? Yeah. I think, as Dante's pointing out, you know, to a very powerful community with lots of, you know, particular interests for sustaining the, you know, Capital Absolutely. and economic interests of particular people. And that could be another theme that seems to be an interesting tension you're kind of pointing to. People mm -hmm. are trying to build up spaces for philosophy, yeah. but have to do it with these power structures that may or may not have normative damage to what we want or to not. be doing. Or not. You know, or not. Or, or not. And, and th that's true even within the university. I mean, the, the, uh, the multiversity of Clark Kerr is not the only higher education institution model in the whole world. Uh, and there have been many, many attempts to kind of move outside of that with you know, St. John's and, and, and the like. So I don't think we want to confuse ourselves about this. We have to build institutions, we have yeah, to I rethink agree. our institutions, and we have to rethink our university existence. Very, very good point. Thank you, Lara. And we have now a last question by Professor Simon D'Agostino. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Well, and grazie, Matteo. <laughs> That's yes. very interesting. So I have a question about the architectonic uh, of the sciences, because I, I don't know what you think about it, but it seems to me that th there is a tension between uh, contemplation and practice in Aristotle himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm yeah. thinking of this, and I'm quoting the Nicomachean Ethics uh, first chapter, yeah. line 1194a to b1, that in English is translated, um, uh, I'm quoting, it would seem to belong to the most authoritative art and that which is most truly the master art. And in Greek, this is doxeie. And then, so it seems that antes kudiotates kai malista architectonikes, and this is politics. Okay. Yeah. So it seems that, that in Aristotle himself, we have yeah, that's absolutely this perfect. kind of tension between the most architectonic or is metaphysics or some practical so 
I think you understand perfectly my question. <laughs> absolutely, and uh, you're absolutely right. In the actual version of the paper, I actually, it's, it's, this is incredible, but I actually make reference to exactly the same passage of, of uh, okay. the Nicomachean Ethics. And uh, yeah, it does seem that a sort of tension that some scholars, such as Etienne Gilson, gets uh, entangled with, you know, goes all the way back to Aristotle. I mean, Dante finds his own way to resolve it. I think there is an, an excellent um, an excellent paper that I just opened here by Monty Ransom Johnson that is titled Aristotle's Architectonic Sciences, which deals precisely with this apparent tension between, you know, politics being the most architectonic science and on the other side, you know, metaphysics being the first first philosophy, basically. How do we reconcile those two? In, I think that at least in Dante's case, I cannot speak of Aristotle in, uh, right now, but in Dante's case, I think he finds a fairly interesting uh, solution. He's saying, you know, the highest good, the highest happiness that we can hope to achieve actually resides in metaphysics. So in a sense, really, we shouldn't question the status of metaphysics as first philosophy. However, on the other hand, ethics, th these are just two different sort of primacies. So ethics has the primacy of turning ourselves. I mean, if there was, it has a sort of ordering primacy. If there was an ethics or politics, in this case, we wouldn't know that the highest happiness that we can experience is actually in theoretical activities. So these are, I mean, this uh, this is not my, my intuition, of course. I'm here relying on uh, the work of, of other Italian scholars, in particular Bruno Nardi, he, he made a reference to the existence of, at least in Dante, of two different sort of primacies, two ideals of, uh, yeah, of primacy. One of ethics, they have different primacies, one of ethics and one of metaphysics. Metaphysics has the primacy of being, you know, the highest science, the most perfect science, the one in which the highest happiness resides. And then there is the, uh, the primacy of ethics, which is the one that allows us, in the first place, to realize that we should engage. In. If if we are after happiness, we should um, be engaged in rational pursuits. Which is, I think, it's in the end, it's it has to be also Dante's take, because if we read not only the Convivio but in the Monarchia, for instance, there, you know, the intellectual theoretical pursuits in the form of sort of collective pursuit of all human beings has a sort of primacy. I mean, the actualization of our intellect, of our political, social intellect in a sort of a various sense, has to be uh, realized uh, in, in the collective pursuit of something like theoretical sciences, which is uh, another interesting chapter uh, that one could investigate. Many thanks, Professor D'Agostino. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, it's uh, it's now time to close this session. Many, many thanks, Matteo, again for this wonderful presentation. And thank you also to all of you who contributed for the discussion. It was a great start of the new academic year. The next session will be on the 18th of October with a presentation by Elder Perlu, but I will send you the usual reminders. For now, thank you. Thank you all again and for being there and see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, everybody, thank you. for being here. It was a pleasure, as always.